Welcome everyone. You're listening to Big Sky Capital podcast. Uh, uh, my name is Dimash. I'm the host, and our guest for today is Robin Butler, who is the partner and the head of impact at Surgeon Capital. Hi, Robin. Hey, Dimash. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, first of all, let's start from your personal background, your education, and the early career moves. Sure. Right. I guess I, I don't have the typical background for someone working in VC, although I don't think there is a typical background for, for VC. Um, I studied Arabic and Middle Eastern history at university in Exeter in the UK. Um, and that included studying a lot of Iranian history, so uh, particularly 20th century. And, and when I left university, it was this uh, short time period when the sanctions had been lifted on Iran and uh, before Trump was elected. So uh, it was it was this kind of land of opportunity. And I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my with, with my career or, or what kind of job would, would be appropriate. So I thought, well, I'll go and live in Iran. I'll learn Farsi and... I'll, I'll have a good time because intellectually I'm interested, but also maybe I can find a job for a European company that wants to work in Iran or an Iranian company that wanted to work outside. I didn't, as you can tell, it wasn't a very clear cut theory or, or thought process. Uh, I, I arrived in September 2016 and, and Trump was elected two months later. So that kind of killed, killed those conversations. Uh, I lived there for nine months. I had a great time. Um, learned pretty good Farsi at, at, at that point. Uh, sadly, it's it's not so good anymore because I don't get the chance to use it. Um, but when I came back, the only people I got interest, uh, got introduced to who were still act actively doing anything in Iran was, was Sturgeon. We, we had a small fund at the time that had been set up when the sanctions were lifted to invest in Iran. And we were introduced. I didn't have any sort of finance background, but um, I guess we had a shared, shared interest in emerging markets and, and sort of Central Asia, Iran, the Middle East. Uh, so yeah, joined joined Sturgeon back then. Uh, did the CFA as a kind of way of learning about sort of finance and building that sort of finance muscle. Um, and I've, I've been 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 at Sturgeon since. So I've been here uh, six years uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So um, it's it's yeah been 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 at one company the whole time. And what was the origin of the interest in Iran or Arabic cultures? Uh, when I was 19, I uh, had the opportunity to go and live in Jordan uh, for three months learning learning Arabic. And I'd always been very interested in history. Uh, it was like my favorite subject when I was younger. And, but I, I, history in England uh, is kind of very Europe focused, a bit of the US, but but not doesn't really l focus that much on the rest of the world. Uh, and when, but when I went to Jordan and actually kind of started to to learn a bit more and understand a, uh, understand a bit about Islamic history, Islamic culture, a Arabic, um, sort of both and then kind of contemporary politics as well, I was uh, just kind of found it fascinating. And um, so when I got to Exeter, I originally was meant to study history, uh, but um, just straight history. However, I got there and I added in Arabic language and then also sort of Middle Eastern studies, Middle Eastern history. Um, so it all, it all, all sort of started there three months in Jordan, without which uh, I don't know what I'd be doing, but but it wouldn't definitely wouldn't be so so focused on this part of the world. Uh, tell us a, a few sentences about the Sturgeon Capital, its investment thesis. Well, maybe I'll give you a bit of background on Sturgeon Capital. So Sturgeon has been around since 2005, uh, and it was originally founded by an Italian gentleman, Clemente Capello, to, to invest in public market securities in Central Asia and the Caucasus. This was at the time of the commodity super cycle, which was driving the Kazakh and Azeri economies. Um, and then you also had the reforms ongoing in Georgia uh, post, post the Rose Revolution. Um, so it was set up to invest primarily in public markets. And that, that was the strategy for the first, let's say, 12 years. Um, around the time that I joined was when we pivoted away from public markets to focus on, on venture capital and, and sort of private markets, because that's really where we saw the opportunity to if you like, if you look across other emerging markets, and it's like tying into our thesis and strategy as a firm, you look at other emerging markets and the transition they've gone from sort of purely offline to, to online. That's happened at different times, at different points in different countries, and has really been a function of a critical mass of smartphone and internet penetration, which are essentially the foundations on which you can build digital businesses. 
uh, that creating the sort of the environment in which startups start to, to kind of emerge, which is then catalyzed by venture capital. Uh, so without that venture funding, the, the ecosystems don't develop, the companies struggle to sort of scale. Once that funding is unlocked, you then see um, these, these sort of, if you like, champions that begin to emerge. And from a kind of an investor's perspective, it's those early funds uh, and those early investors, and also it's their early funds, which really have delivered outsized returns for, for, for investors. Um, you look in Indonesia and India and South America, that's, that's broadly been the case. So our, our thesis is that in Central Asia and the Caucasus and South Asia, you have markets which are primed in terms of smartphone and internet penetration, as well as the sort of beginnings of venture, venture ecosystems. Um, but which has still got a long way to go to follow in the path of India, Indonesia, Brazil, these, these other countries. And that by being early and investing in some of those kind of early leading startups, uh, we can help kind of develop that ecosystem, but also deliver uh, significant returns for, for, for our investors. Yep, that's a really interesting thesis. Uh, you started as an analyst at the Sturgeon, right? And yes. you're uh, for more than five years for now at Sturgeon. Exactly. Yeah. So started started. I mean, we're we're a small firm. So uh, what was the process of becoming the VC analyst? Um, if you remember, well, I, I uh, as I said, I mean, I didn't have a finance background. So I remember my interview uh, with Sturgeon, which started off with some question financial questions, sort of investment questions, and I, I had to be honest. I said I didn't really know anything. I I could talk about history and politics and, and culture, but I, I didn't know, didn't have much to say when it came to finance. So my, my interview process was a, maybe a bit of a different one. Um, yeah. And what you can say today about your path from the analyst to the partner? Um, again, it's, if you're at a large firm, it's, it's more clearly defined that kind of analyst, associate, uh, principal, director or however you get kind of it's it's structured uh, with Sturgeon being being a small firm um although my title has has changed um my role I, it say hasn't changed a huge amount um mm -hmm. everyone is involved in every aspect of 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 the business of Sturgeon whether that's on the investment side operations fundraising um and that that's been the case the whole way through so uh while while the title sound, sounds a little bit grander and and maybe it is it is it is in a way um, I don't really, uh, I often think that titles are only important if you're looking to change job and I've got no plan to change job. So at the moment, uh, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't have as much meaning. And what does the head of impact mean? Head of impact. So uh, at Sturgeon, we are, uh, or we aim to be a for profit and for impact investor. Um, and that impact strategy is focused on creating employment opportunities supporting financial inclusion and encouraging kind of a diverse and inclusive uh, venture ecosystem within our own startups, but also outside as well. Uh, and that's kind of the, the part of the side of the business that, that, that I head up. So hence, I am head of impact, but I am head of no one but myself. So again, the title sounds sounds perhaps grander than it, than it is in reality. Uh, I had the chance uh, about a year ago to speak with Kian in person. And, yeah. Uh, had the impression that he is a smart and wise uh, man. Uh, do you have uh, the lesson working with Kian? I mean, we've been, I guess, we've been working together for over six years, which uh, someone said to me the other day, they said, what's it like working at the same company for six years? And it's, uh, well, actually, um, it has that's been... a second question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it has been, it has been the same company, but it's what we've been working on has changed each year. It's like, uh, this year, we're working on launching a new fund. Last year, we were focused on kind of expanding into sort of Pakistan and Bangladesh, as well as looking at Egypt and some other Middle Eastern countries. Uh, the year before that, we were really kind of focused just on Central Asia. The year before that was COVID. So like every year has been very different. So it doesn't feel like six years of doing the same job. It feels almost like each each year or even kind of even six month periods have been each each one has been very different from the other. Um, so what would I, I'd say I've kind of learned from Kian, I mean, the, the, without sounding too, too cheesy, but, uh, it's a, a, a significant amount of what I, what I understand today with regarding to investing and, and, and venture and, 
um, uh, to to the time spent working working with him and and, and for him. Uh, any particular kind of focus on I feel like the kind of what really what is the like long term enduring value in in a business uh, or a business model um, which kind of sustains sustains over time. I guess maybe that comes more from the sort of value investing world of of, of uh, public pub, uh, public markets. But I think can be can be transferred and and, and applied in in private markets as well. That um, which some sometimes can get lost in the hype. I mean, we're we've seen a lot of hype recently around different business models within within venture. It's AI at the moment. It was quick commerce. It was it was uh, Web three. It's it, it's been very. We, this is this is true over the years. Um, but actually, take trying to take a step back and say, well, okay, what what endures over time? And what's the structure of the surgeon look like? How many funds? What's the asset under management? So Sturgeon, um, we break it down. We have the the venture capital side of the business, which is kind of the core of the business where where, where I'm focused. Um, that meant we raised the first fund for that in 2020, which was a 25 million dollar fund. Uh, that fund made 18 investments in eight countries, including in Ukraine, Georgia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Egypt, UAE, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Uh, that fund is now pretty much fully fully deployed. Uh, the second fund, which we're raising at the moment, is a target thirty five million dollar fund. Uh, with a, we're having our first institutional close in September. Um, again, still focused on Central Asia and South Asia. Uh, still investing at sort of seed up to Series A, check size five hundred k and and um, and um, upwards. Uh, then outside of venture, if you like, kind of the team structure within that. So we have the kind of partners based in London. But we also have team members on the ground. So Ali John is, is based in Tashkent, Saad is based in Karachi, and Waze is based in Dhaka. They act as a sort of eyes and ears on the ground for us to make sure that we see all the deal flow and due diligence it effectively and then provide real post-investment support. That's on the venture side. Uh, on the, the other side, we have um, uh, the private equity fund or private equity strategy. So we, we manage a, a fund in, in Kazakhstan on behalf of Chevron. Yep. Uh, which is a $250 million private equity focused fund. Uh, so total AUM across Sturgeon is, is ju just under just under 300 million at the moment. Yep, I remember writing to your, one of your colleagues in Kazakhstan <laughs> about this, um, a few startups and they said, now nah, we do like, we're managing Chevron's uh, private equity money. So I texted the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, anything on the VC side, better to come to myself or, or one of the other team members that I mentioned just there. The focus for the team for, in Kazakhstan is really more on, on sort of larger, more traditional private equity businesses. Yeah, I see, I see. Uh, about the investment thesis, uh, for this year, I saw lots of the articles saying that uh, after the raising of the interest rates, uh, the venture capital in emerging markets uh, has died. What do you think of that? <laughs> because we as the VC also covering the Central Asia, we are quite uh, feeling that. I mean, what is it? What has it done? I mean, the, the reality of interest rates going up has pushed up the rate of return on other less less risky assets. Um, I mean, speaking to someone the other day on a deal, uh, a structured debt deal in, in the UK related to uh, kind of gas stations. Was offering around 11 11 percent return backed by i think morgan stanley one of the big banks so like that's that, that's the reality of when you think about global asset allocators where they can invest funds out where they can generate returns there are far less risky options with far high now much higher rates of return so that's kind of the reality for for vc globally that fund that capital which was flowing in in such returns is no longer having to come into vc um, the challenge for emerging markets is what well, what that's done in developed markets is brought the valuations down for uh, developed market startups. So VCs are no longer having to go to emerging markets to get good valuations. They can get good valuations at home with lower risk uh, in terms of funding risk, uh, clearer path to exit, uh, greater availability of kind of talent. I mean, still greater competition. I think there are a lot of reasons why emerging markets are still a more exciting place to invest. Um, but that has sucked a lot of kind of international capital out from emerging markets. But I think what's encouraging to see is an increasing amount, and I think particularly in Central Asia, of sort of local capital that's stepping in. 
and particularly at that kind of pre-seed and seed stage. It's diff more difficult at Series A and B for larger rounds, but at sort of pre-seed and seed stage to build that kind of pipeline of deals. Um, I remember when we started investing in Uzbekistan kind of what, nearly five years ago, uh, when we had conversations with the government, it was uh, the, the kind of the concept of, of a startup or a technology company was that it had to be hardware, like software, software wasn't technology, it had to be hardware. So things have changed a lot. Um, back then, there really weren't any other, in certainly no other international investors, uh, and limited number of kind of regional investors beyond a few angel investors. Um, now the situation is very difficult. Obviously, there's Big Sky, uh, two or three other funds in Kazakhstan, two or three funds in Uzbekistan, uh, 500 Global in Georgia, looking at the region. So, so uh, it, the ecosystem is developing. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that the, the venture or startups are, are dead in emerging markets. I think the, the, the reality has shifted back to something closer to normality, which is that there is less funding available. So you have to be more efficient with the capital that you have. However, uh, the cost of doing business is lower. The level of competition is lower as well. So if you can build good product and figure out sort of uh, a, a low kind of uh, go, or a low cost go to market strategy, absolutely like um, kind of viral go to market strategy, whether that's B two B or B two C, there is the opportunity to build large businesses from a from a revenue perspective. And I think it's often misleading when people think about like sort of a successful business has to have a, a high valuation. Like valuation is a function of success. It is not success in its own right. And actually, if you can build a $20 million recurring revenue business in Central Asia, but you only raise like $3 million, like you, your valuation is not going to seem like as high. It's not like you've raised 50 million, but you've got there very efficiently. And then when you exit, um, that's the value, that's the only valuation that really counts. And that's the one where you, you and your investors will, will, will do very well. Yep. The ecosystem has grown like very rapidly. Uh, so you don't have, uh, do you don't feel much pressure to invest right now? Um, we, 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 we try, we try not to ever be in a rush to invest. Um, we prefer to be, um, to kind of take our time and, and look, we don't make hundreds of investments we make sort of 10 to 20 from a fund um so we we prefer to take our time to get to know the founders to understand the opportunity um and so that when we do invest we are really kind of committed to the to the company and to the uh, to the founders and can actually really add value after that as well mm -hmm. and what's the process of deal sourcing at your firm and what do you look in the founders Sure. So deal, deal sourcing is kind of a few buckets. We, we try to work with, with the kind of local VCs in each country um, who obviously kind of have, have an existing portfolio and have, uh, spend, spend, have their focus there. Uh, we have our on the ground presence as well. Um, I travel regularly. I, I mean, I travel probably 50, 50% 50 plus of the time. Um, and uh, yeah. Try Where do you live right now? I, I live in London. Um, this year I've, I've, up until the end of May, I think I was in London for about four weeks, five weeks. The rest of the time I was traveling. So I'd say I live in London for tax purposes, which is very inefficient. But uh, yeah, so that's 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 kind of the, the, uh, the, the way we work. But also we get a lot of referrals, I think, from existing portfolio founders or other founders that we know or other players in the ecosystem. Um, also, uh, quite a few people get in touch. I don't know, LinkedIn, websites, these sort of these sorts of angles as well. Mm -hmm. And what do you look in the founders at that regions? Because most of the time, the their addressable markets are not so big, just because of the limitation of the country, for example. So yeah, I mean that's that's one consideration, and and generally, so it varies. If if it's Pakistan or Bangladesh, the local market is probably big enough. Um, like those are those are significant countries. Uh, if it's Central Asia, and they are targeting Central Asia. We have to have to believe that they can scale from one country into multiple countries in the region. Very few markets are big enough in one country, apart from financial services. That's that's always the biggest TAM um, in each country. So really we're sitting, okay, can this scale? Is the regional market big enough? And do we think that these this founder, these this group of founders can scale to capture that opportunity? Um in terms of the actual founder qualities themselves, 
a lot of them are qualitative, so it can be quite hard to measure in in a, in, a, in in an initial meeting. I think there's that sort of intangible concept of grit and determination, um, because in the end, like you're I saw something that basically as a founder you have to eat eat no for breakfast every day, which which I thought was a, a, an accurate way of describing it. And that takes that takes an unusual character. I mean, most for most people that would be that sounds like well, why on earth would I want to put myself through it? Um, so it's kind of really looking for founders that have a slightly ab- abnormal willingness to 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 be told no and to keep going to to manage setbacks and and keep keep going on. Uh, like founders who are, who are data driven and and not just in like everyone says that data driven as a founder, but someone who really has a firm grasp of of what me- what the key metrics are for their business, where they are today, where they were six months ago, where they want to get them to in six months' time. Um, I think a big part of that and a question we often look at is sort of like how what's the dashboard that a founder has that, and how often are they looking at? What is on that dashboard? What are the KPIs? What are the metrics? And how, is it something they look at once a week, once a day, once a month? How live is that data? Because that's really the only way they can truly be testing different ideas and then and then actually deciding, yes, this one's working, therefore we'll kind of invest more in it, or this one's not, we should be kind of pivoting or, 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 or rethinking our strategy. If you're just sort of, I think the, the, the poorer or the lower quality founders just sort of have ideas and then just kind of go like throw money in it. Like that, that it might work. It's not like look, people have made money over the years just getting lucky, throwing money at problems. But I think a good founder not can sort of figure out what that problem is, break it down, quantify it, understand what success would look like, and then start to, if you like, sort of step by step invest in finding a solution to it or building a build building a solution around it. Um, that's those 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 are the great or, or, or best founders I have always found. Yep. Every time when you ask the founders about their unit economics or, or their burn rates, uh, that reveals everything about them and like their analytical mindset. Yes, and what, exactly. are, what are the most common reasons uh, to say that no to the founder? Yeah. Um, so... Sometimes we say no because it's just not in our mandate, like wrong geography or a business model that we just don't know. We don't typically do a lot of hardware businesses. Um, we don't know it as well. Not not to say we, we don't. It's like we, we have made a couple of inv- hardware, more hardware focused investments, but we're pr- typically more software focused. So not not meeting mandate in terms of geography or business model. Uh, being too early stage. Um, so if we don't, we invest kind of post revenue, post product. So we'll like, we'll always take a call, get like to introduce and meet that person. You mean pre revenue? Uh, sorry. You mean pre revenue? Yes, we don't you invest pre pre revenue or pre product. Mm-hmm. Um, so we will, uh, yeah, like that. Well, it's, I guess it's not pass. It's like, look, let's wait and see. Keep keep me updated and let's see. But it, when a company is in our sweet spot in terms of sort of stage, geography, business model, um, often it comes down to either we don't have conviction around the team. Um, we think that the business model itself, the unit economics don't make sense. Uh, maybe the market isn't big enough or what they're kind of going for, for it to be able to generate the returns that we need. It might be that it can be like a, a twenty million dollar business valuation business that which would be fantastic for the, maybe for the founders, but for us to generate the returns we're targeting, that just doesn't make sense. So you know, those three cover most of it. Um, sometimes it's just sort of often it's kind of founder driven, but not necessarily tangible. Is that kind of just you, you know if if you're having to ask, is this a great founder? then that's your answer it's 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 not um but sometimes people demonstrate over time like we might pass and then say look keep us updated six months later you realize that actually while this person maybe isn't isn't great in in every aspect actually their ability to execute and to build is is uh is 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 stronger than we thought uh unfortunately one of the mistakes that we see really often is that the founders came to us uh, for seed round 
and they all they have uh, given 30 percent of the company to some kind of micro fund or the angels yeah have you seen that such examples yeah i've seen it a few times and i mean we've we've had a couple of experiences really like the answer the, the answer is they need to sort it out with that investor otherwise we yeah we just wouldn't we just wouldn't invest um we it kind of as much as we might like the company or the founder or the opportunity, if that cap table is messed up, it's if it's if you're doing it for your before your first proper seed round, it's much easier to sort it out then. Once you've had that seed round, once you've had you start trying to raise a Series A, it's going to be much much more difficult. Um, we quite uh, quite uh, aware what's happening at the Central Asia market, but about the Egypt, Bangladesh, Pakistan. What are the uh, average deal terms, the valuation, the rounds, round sizes? What's going on on there on these markets? So if we if we compare sort of Pakistan and Bangladesh to Uzbekistan, typically the sort of round sizes uh, or to Central Asia, typically the round sizes are, are larger. Um, it's in, in over the last couple of years that's generally been because there's more money available. Uh, for these markets, and because the markets are bigger, you sort of just need more money in order to to scale. Um, whereas in Central Asia, you can get away with with less money. So I'd say round sizes tend to be bigger. Uh, valuations, as a result, are usually a bit higher. I mean, that kind of particularly early stage, um, that valuation being a bit more art than science, and trying to manage dilution and ownership. Um, also, you have a larger addressable market in your own country. Um, although often that addressable market is overstated, people will say, well, 220 million people in Pakistan, you say, well, okay, which ones are actually online, which ones actually have disposable income or really have a propensity to use a product or service like yours is usually much, much, much lower. So, um, at that kind of, we look at sort of round size and valuations tend to be bigger and higher respectively. Um, and, but broadly, like actually in terms of sophistication of the businesses and the founders i mean you you, you get great great founders in in almost every market mm -hmm. and uh, among these mentioned markets uh which one is the most developed and where the the most venture capital available for the founders so 2020 and 2021 it was pakistan which definitely had the most capital available that is now kind of dried up uh, because the economy has taken a battering and there's been political uncertainty um bangladesh is pretty limited there's a few local funds but and a few international vcs looking at the market but pretty limited i mean not dissimilar to central asia so while pakistan maybe has a bit more it's it's not more it's not by much um it, these all of these markets generally are defined by a less a, a, a deficiency or a lack of venture capital and what do the markets have like most promising uh, markets in the near future so um it kind of depends what vertical you mean the two countries which i'm pretty bullish on are uzbekistan and bangladesh both if you look at it from a macro perspective have political stability um have uh kind of strong economic growth uh positive uh demographic trends um and also sort of coming from a pretty low base in terms of sort of what exists already uh, in terms of did both the sort of wider economy but also in terms of digitalization so bullish on both those countries um georgia is an interesting case it's a small country but a lot of talented entrepreneurs and always building globally or or at least regionally from day one um kazakhstan's an interesting market because you have caspi they sort of uh they make it very difficult to build consumer facing businesses anymore because they own distribution if you're successful they'll kill you um or they can kill you or they buy you for not very much so it's an interesting but then on, on the kind of b2b space i think there's there's some interesting companies and opportunities there um and then you get the odd one i always I know a couple of interesting ones in azerbaijan and kyrgyzstan in these other markets as well so each each country has its own it seems to have a couple each country has a couple of founders who stand out at least uh i had the uh, peter finley from anchorless bangladesh uh, uh at the podcast 
and he's uh, really bullish on the Bangladesh market, uh, especially because of the tech expertise there. Yeah. What do you can say about the expertise in the Bangladesh or Central Asia? Uh, is it like uh, very different from the U.S. market or the China market? Um, I mean, look, the the depth of talent is much less in Bangladesh or Central Asia. You get you do get very high caliber individuals, but the the number of them is just much less, and that's because you haven't had like these venture and digital ecosystems are still very very nascent, it's very early stage. So you just haven't had multiple. You haven't had la a large number of startups, a number of exits kind of uh, skills, trans skill and knowledge transfer. So in terms of that kind of compared to a US or China, just you, you have you have some very talented individuals, but the depth of talent is is much less. Uh, I have a similar qu question about the markets, but not in terms of the countries, in terms of the industries. Where do you see the most venture capital are going in and to, what's the promising industries in that region? So I kind of fintech, e-commerce and logistics have, have seen have seen the most money flow into them, which is kind of understandable when you're at the early stage of that sort of digitalization. Those are the kind of foundations that need to be built. You need to build the financial rails for digital payments. You need to open, increase the penetration of financial products and services wider around the economy. E-commerce kind of logistics is the foundation as well for sort of logist, logistics tech. For a lot of that e-commerce and then e-commerce is sort of just a lot of it kind of copycatting existing business models um but sort of bringing them in in in, in, in into the market um then i mean down the line you more opportunity for more sophisticated whether it's sort of agri-tech ed tech health tech as well um but so far most of that money has flowed into yeah, let's say logistics fintech and uh, uh e-commerce mm -hmm. uh... I saw that you are the board member at the few startups and uh, most of the time there's like no, not much the serial entrepreneurs and uh, not not a lot of the experience in the founders. Uh, what's your approach uh, to that startups? Do you have like more hands-on approach or hands-off? Hands what, what, what's your value add for the founders? In the region, look, we, we we never want to get involved in the sort of day to day operations. Like we, we wouldn't back a company if we thought we needed to do that. Um, our focus is more on that kind of if you like the sort of strategic level, or, or that's where we want to be helping. Um, and the kind of the, the value that we add, I think, is 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 several fold. On the on the one hand, we have a portfolio now of uh, twenty two companies across eight eight different countries, or nine 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 countries. Um, with that, we see a lot of like some some issues or challenges are business model specific. Some are startup stage stage specific, but we see a lot of that, and we're able to take the lessons we learn from that and share them with founders at an earlier stage or at a sort of similar business model to support them and, and like de decrease their error rate and therefore increase the prob probability of success. We also have having an on the ground presence in multiple markets means that we can genuinely support companies when they are entering new markets where we have a presence. Uh, we've done that with multiple companies now, whether it's sort of helping incorporate, acquire, hire, launch operations. That's really an area that we focus on. Uh, and then to go alongside that is on, is on fundraising. So the our kind of hybrid international local approach as a, as a VC means that we're, we're plugged in locally. We're both with investors, but also the kind of ecosystem. But then also with that international presence means that we're we're well connected with the sort of the follow-on later stage capital that can that, that can sort of bridge that gap beyond the sort of Series A, Series B point. Mm -hmm. The your average check size is uh, quite significant for the that startups. Uh, do you see the investors for the next rounds or? What do you think of the liquidity on that market, M&A activity, or what are the corporations thinking about the startup ecosystem? So yeah, our check size with 500K and upwards um, means that there are not hundreds of investable deals for us. Uh, we have to be pretty selective uh, to make sure that we are um, 
yeah, in, really investing in the highest quality companies that can actually use the money that we are investing in them efficiently yep. and effectively. Um, in terms of the sort of liquidity at, at seed and pre-seed, I think there is quite a bit of funding available uh, locally, um, as well as some international funds that would look at these markets. At Series A, Series B, there are only a few funds that have the capacity to write significant checks at that stage, and also which will uh, and also which will look at these markets. So liquidity is, is is much more limited. I mean, broadly, we what we really fo try to focus on and encourage companies is that you pre Series A, you have reached a point where if you need to be, you can be break even. Because that then takes the time pressure off fundraising. If you have to raise in the next six months, suddenly that you have very little leverage with investors in terms of valuation and timelines and things. Whereas if you have reached that point, we say, look, if you give me money, I will grow and I will burn. If you don't give me money, I will just grow steadily and I won't burn. Now, in the US, that would be like a crazy thing. It's like, no, no, you've got to like raise and just hyperscale and this sort of thing. I don't think that really works in these markets. One, because the market readiness to hyperscale a product is just not there, but also there's just not the funding available to get you to the scale that kind of makes sense and you actually make money. So our approach being a bit different to that and say, okay, try and de-risk yourself by taking away the necessity to fundraise. If you can, and you have done that, you can then go to market and have, if it takes six months to get an investor on board, that's fine. You're like, okay, we'll just keep growing 5% a month. We won't burn any money. That's okay. You give us money, we can grow 15, 20% per month, but that's something we just kind of wait, wait for and, 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 and are ready for if it, if it comes along. What about the acquisition possibilities? In what sense? The potential acquirers for these companies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there some big corporations that might buy out the startups? Because in Kazakhstan, is the activity I think just started, and we have yeah. uh, some corporations that started even thinking about that. Yeah. Well, I think uh, well, it's as, as you know too, as you know all all too well, the kind of mindset towards startups and venture backed businesses is still just developing. Like people, uh, his traditional business people have focused on. Uh, Cash, cash flow, profit, how quickly do I get my money back? And a lot of them cause problems for startups in these countries by taking, as you said, like 30% equity. And then after a year being like, where's my money? It's like, oh, I spent it all and I have nothing left. Like, sorry, well, not sorry, but this is how this game works. Um, I think those business people are sort of adapting and understanding that actually technology is, if you like, they're, maybe they've, they've had these traditional businesses in the past, but now they're in it like, The, the future is more of these kind of technology or technology enabled companies, especially if that technology is in some way complementary to existing traditional sort of offline businesses that they that they have. I think we're increasingly seeing as well as some of these sort of private equity funds looking at later stage deals as an opportunity to sort of drive returns on a fund level with some of those kind of smaller tickets, but which can ultimately sort of have, have a meaningful impact on IRR. I think there's there's also the opportunity where if you are a market leader in a country or a region, you become an, an attractive acquisition target for a larger, more global or international or neighboring region uh, company to um, acquire you. So if you're in Pakistan, that's generally from the Middle East. If you're in Bangladesh, that could be from India or even from Southeast Asia. In Central Asia, I think it could come from Europe or it could come from uh, China. Historically, there was maybe more interest from Russia, but that's now more, more difficult to handle in the, in the current political situation. Hopefully that will change before uh, change change sooner sooner rather than later. So that's kind of generally how we see it. And, and then there will be outliers as well of, of businesses which are kind of can reach a really a, a much larger scale. I think Caspi is an example of a technology company or technology enabled company that has been able in Kazakhstan, which with 18 million people is not a big country. Uh, but to reach a point where it can IPO in London and, and now I, I, I forget what the valuation is at the moment, but sort of plus $10 billion dollar valuation uh, and continuing to grow and sort of create create value. So there is that opportunity. And, and I think those those will be the outliers, but we hopefully we'll see a few more of those kind of companies that come through. Yep. You also mentioned that you are in the middle of the fundraising for the fund two. 
uh, as well as we are at Big Sky. But we have a we have a kind of opposite uh, investment thesis because we invest into immigrants that go global to the U.S. to the Southeast Asia, and also covering the Central Asia. But you have uh, the thesis on Central Asia and other emerging markets. Um, how, how hard is it to raise on that in this investment thesis right now? I mean, look, there are the majority of potential LPs or LPs in the world will will never sort of will, will, will never get comfortable with this sort of opportunity set. Like their their risk appetite, their attitude, their mentality will just never never come around, and that's fine. Like they were never they're never going to come around. We're, we're okay with that. We'll talk to them maybe and. They might find it interesting, but they'll just never be able to sort of get the the investment side of it uh, set, set set up. Um, then you then you have a kind of a different bucket. You you have we have several buckets we tend to work with. On the one hand, you have some of the development institutions such as the IFC, ADB, and the like, who have a mandate to invest in these countries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they have struggled to allocate resources efficiently, especially within sort of the technology space and early stage space. So we're a kind of natural partner, and we work closely with a lot of those. You then have, um, when they are less return driven, more impact driven, you then have the return, return driven investors who are sort of, on the one hand, some kind of larger institutions, uh, it could be endowments, pension funds who have an interest in emerging markets as a form of sort of diversification and, and, and generating real alpha within their portfolio, uh, as well as then more like family offices and high net worths who typically have some kind of operating or historical exposure to these countries. Maybe they made money in Indonesia five years ago, and they see that Central Asia and South Asia are similar on a similar trajectory. Um, so we, we we work a lot with those as well. But I mean, look, fundraising is never easy. You have you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find to find your princess or whatever the, whatever the, your prince or whatever the right the right way to put it is. Um, and in the current climate as well, with opportunities elsewhere, I mean, we're not going to sort of kid ourselves and say it's easy. I think we've over the last sort of four years have built relationships with some some really interesting investors who who I think believe in what we do and and I kind of want to be long-term partners with us um, but still it's 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 uh, it's a long slog which I guess for any founders who think that uh, the VC VC is def being a VC is definitely easier than being a founder but fundraising isn't necessarily any easier but do you have the LPs from the markets where you invest in no, I mean, the majority of our LPs are US, European, Middle Eastern, some from, from sort of Singapore and, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, majority of our money comes from outside. All right, all right, got it. Um, do you have some kind of invest uh, advice for me as the associate at the firm uh, or the other guys who are just at the beginning of their career? Uh, I think uh, general advice based off my own experience is kind of take any opportunity for responsibility. So when there are new ideas, or new projects, even if they're kind of crazy and like the probability of them happening is, is low, uh, you kind of that, when we think about like people that, that, that we, we hire and that we employ, what we look for is that kind of independence. Like we have an idea. Okay. Who, who wants to, who wants to run with it? And like, we'll be there to support, but really, if you can be the sort of individual, and I always remember someone telling me this when I was younger, is like, you, you don't want to be the person who goes to your manager or whatever with problems. You want to be the one that goes with solutions. You want to turn up and say, look, this is the problem. This is how I think we can fix it. Are you okay for me to go and do it? That's like the ideal thing for someone sort of managing you or more senior. Um, so kind of taking, taking any opportunity for responsibility um, and I, I think particularly in this industry, always having like maintaining the respect for founders, um, because like their, their job is, is, is an incredibly difficult one. They might not always have respect for, for VCs because they may well have had negative experiences, but broadly, I think that that respect for founders and the difficulty with, it takes to build their businesses. Once you have that kind of empathy, I think your ability to build relationships with them in, in, increases. Uh, and I think it also makes you just a, a better investor to, to to work with as well. And what what you can recommend to the founders uh, in terms of the books, blogs, or podcasts to just uh, understand more the rules of the game and mm -hmm. how the processes work? Yeah, it's uh, 
So there's a very good book called Power Law, uh, yeah. which is kind of looks at the well, history, really. yeah, his history of venture capital. Um, there's also uh, a book called Out Out Innovate um, by Alex Lazaro, which is, is looking at sort of like venture capital in outside of sort of the historical centers. I think both of those give a good sense of the kind of history of how the industry has evolved. Uh, I was kind of introduce some of the terms as well. I, I'm a I'm a historian, so generally uh, uh, look look at sort of where things have come from to understand where they are today, and and hopefully have an idea of where they might go in the future. Um, there are so many podcasts out there. I mean, Twenty VC by Harry Stebbings is as is very popular. Um, I'm trying to think which other ones. Uh, I mean, if you're in if you're in Central Central Asia, um, Arman uh, Arman Sulemanov's uh, podcast and and factorial mm -hmm. podcast is, yep. is very good. I don't great that. episode by the way no thank you I, I mean i think there are a lot more or a lot better ones on there as well but uh yeah you could use some some very interesting people high quality people there so it's so worth 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 having a listen all right so mm, that's it from from me uh thanks thanks a lot robin uh for doing the podcast and no problem it was, it, was, it was a pleasure joining you thanks very much for the questions uh, i really enjoyed the conversation Thanks everyone for listening to the Big Sky Capital podcast. And if you are the founder of the seed startup, post product, post revenue, <laughs> we'll, we'll provide the links in the description to Surging Capital. So uh, yeah, you can contact with Robin, I think. Yes, please. Any uh, LinkedIn through our website, uh, or if you uh, have a, if we have any mutual connections, founders or investors, um, always, always interested to hear from hear, hear hear about what you're doing, kind of why why you're doing it, and uh, and who knows, maybe maybe there is an opportunity for us for us to invest. All right, thanks thanks everyone. Uh, till the next episode.